Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Parsley Box Group PLC interim results for the six months ending 30th of June 2021 investor presentation. Throughout this presentation, investors will be in listen only mode. Questions are encouraged and can be submitted at any time using the Q&A tab situated on the right hand corner of your screen. Please just simply type in your question and press send. The company may not be in a position to answer every question it receives during the meeting itself. However, the company will review all questions submitted today and publish responses where it's appropriate to do so. These will be available via your Investor Meet Company dashboard and we'll send you an email to notify you when they're ready for your review. I'd also like to remind you that this presentation is being recorded. Before we begin, we would like to submit the following poll and if you would give that your kind attention, we would be most grateful. And I'd now like to hand over to Cal Ball Edwards, Head of IR at Parsleybox. Good afternoon. Thank you, Mark. Um, good afternoon and welcome for and um, welcome to this presentation. Thank you for joining us. I'd like to hand over to my colleagues, Kevin Duran, the CEO, and John Swan, Chief Finance Officer. They will run through the presentation and then we will address questions at the end. Thank you. Thanks, Cam. Um, so welcome to our shareholders uh, to this uh, first half one results. Um, I'm going to split this up between John and I and just to give you a quick run through uh, of us. So I'm the CEO, John is the CFO, and um, we are going to really split it um, between us. Uh, so the first half, uh, one overview, I'm going to give you a quick understanding of where we think the key drivers of the business are. John's really then going to spend some time looking at the financial highlights. Um, I'm going to talk about strategy and product. Uh, and then uh, between us, we'll, we'll deal with the summary and outlook and, and question and answers. So just to remind everybody um, what Parsleybox is all about. Um, so our mission is to promote, support and celebrate independent living and well-being. So that really is focusing on the over 60 demographic, that what we call the baby boomer plus consumer. And we're trying to initially make meal times easier by delivering uh, a range of meals uh, directly to consumers throughout the UK um, direct to their door. And now, obviously, the major benefit for our customers in that is convenience. We're, they're able to save time, uh, they'll be able to get products delivered to them, and they're able to have a wide variety of choice that you wouldn't typically get within a retail environment, specifically focused on the, those um, this demographic. And we definitely uh, have seen significant growth over the four years that uh, we've been in existence. And as you can see from the bottom, we've already got over 22, nearly 23,000 reviews on Trustpilot. And I'll talk through some of the metrics and the, the customer growth, but we're still on a significant growth journey that we want to continue. Uh, and we hope that you will remain with us and, and support us in our journey. So in terms of uh, the first half of 2021, I think the first thing to say about that is that the, the comparison of the first half of 2020 um, is quite a tough comp. Um, it, you know, you, we saw an influx of customers, as did all food retailers uh, in that period. And so we still seen 26 percent growth year on year uh, against that comparison, 14 million in revenue in the first half. Um, new revenue uh, of nearly 3 million, that's new customer recruited within that period, and repeat revenue, which, as I will and John will explain later, is the underlying deliverer of profitability of around 11 million. So the majority of our revenue comes from repeat customers today. Um, we've seen really good progress on our key performance indicators. So we've grown our active customer base from over 100,000 customers at the beginning of 2020 or first half of 2020 to over 178,000 customers in the first half of 2021. Our repeat uh, average order value has progressed very well. Again, even against quite a hard comparison in the first half of 2020. Uh, and we've seen a slight decline, uh, around a pound decline in new customer AOV. But we are seeing that uh, returning to a more normalized level. And the real reason for that uh, is, is, again, the comparison. We saw an influx of customers paying full price for the product just to get supply in, in a couple of months during 2020. And that obviously increased the AOV. But at a more normalized level, we're still seeing very positive momentum on it. We, we're talking about um, building the team today and a lot about innovation. So um, we have increased and extended the team 
uh, in a number of areas. But the one that we're really going to focus on today is on product innovation. And I'll talk about that after John's run through his financial numbers. Um, and we have delivered our first project. And then on top of that, we've hired uh, Holly McCoom as our CFO. Um, she uh, has got significant experience. She's starting next week. Uh, and John's done a fantastic job from when he joined two years ago, thinking that having come out of retirement, he was going to have a part-time uh, CFO job. Um, you know, I really want to thank him for all his hard work, especially over the last 12 months in, in the run-up to the and, and successful flotation and the amount of work that uh, he did single-handedly, I really want to thank him for, for all of that work. Um, in terms of product innovation, we're going to talk about the um, chilled range, and we're seeing encouraging early signs on that. I'll talk about a bit more about that later. And we definitely have seen some elevation within the ambient range, and again, I'll talk uh, through that. So I'll hand over to John and let him talk through uh, the financial numbers. Okay, thank you, Kevin. Um... The full six-month interim results are included in this presentation at the end of the deck and have comparatives for half one, 21 and 20, together with the, the full year 2020. Parsley Box provides meals to its customers by a, a DTC model, and key drivers of revenue are growth in active customers, customer retention and average order value, or AOV. Marketing spend is the key cost directly associated with driving revenue, particularly in respect of New customer acquisition. Acquiring new customers grows the repeat order base, where we have a gross profit margin of some 50 plus percent. The key for um, the business to grow is to grow the customer base while managing the cost of acquiring these customers. In my review of the fi finance numbers, I'll look at half 20, half 21, but also half 1 2019 to highlight both the growth of the company as well as COVID-related impacts, which in addition to accelerating the expansion of the business, have also had impacts on the cost base when we compare the 20 and 21 periods. I'll start by giving an overview of the income statement and then we'll look at some of the drivers um, that uh, are behind the numbers. So, oops. So this is the financial summary. Um, the financial summary focuses on the key areas in the income statement, and I'll comment on some of the lines in the table before going into more detail on our KPIs that support the data. Revenue growth at 26% year on year and improved gross margin percentage is driven by several factors. As I mentioned, customer acquisition and increasing AOV is key, but also the increased proportion or mix of repeat to new orders Continuing low returns and product issues, and, and we only have a 0.06% uh, product issue uh, on, on the number of products that we ship. Managing discounting on offers to existing customers, and also minimising stock write-off. Fulfilment costs as a percentage of sales have fallen from 23 to 21%, with a consequent improvement in the gross margin. And marketing, as laid out in our IPO presentation, we are a capital light -like business, and the main use of funding is the accelerated spend on marketing to drive growth. We've invested heavily in brand or generic marketing via TV campaigns, and you'll have perhaps seen a ad about sticky toffee pudding and swiping right. Brand marketing will help position the company and gives longer term benefit in respect of recruitment. And this is seen in our brand awareness, which I'll touch on in a later slide. Looking at the G&A line, um, we have been impacted by COVID-related costs and Parsley Box did maintain its call centre operations throughout the pandemic in order to continue to trade and serve a vulnerable section of society. As we handle credit card transactions, this requires a secure office environment and necessitated investment, as well as in screens and, and cleaning and all that sort of things. The main cost was in doubling our office space to managing this, manage the social distance requirements. This is not included in the GA as it's a depreciation cost under IFRS, and I'll look at that in a later slide. As Kevin has mentioned, we've in, in invested in staff hires in 2021, with the call centre headcount rising as a consequence of increased inbound and outbound call levels. We are putting in automation to become more efficient in the call centre, though we do invest heavily in call times, as spending time with our customers benefits us in terms of loyalty and customer feedback. 
We've also made key hires in marketing and NPD to drive acquisition and retention and focus on product improvement and improvement to maximise order uptake and reorder levels to ensure maximum marketing spend efficiencies. Lastly, we've also had additional audit, legal and compliance costs this year as a consequence of being a PLC. And as noted on the slide, we have had exceptional costs in the period in relation to IPO and share-based payments. So if we now look at, in a little more detail at the revenue growth, as it states in the first bullet, 26% of the year-on-year -year growth highlights positive progress. And this is despite a beneficial sales environment in 2020 due to the COVID spike. The key drivers for maintaining growth are continuing to effectively recruit new customers and retain these customers while increasing the AOV. Within the 26% growth, repeat year-on-year -year growth is 48%. And remember, growing the repeat revenue as a percentage of total sales drives margin improvement for us. We also can see strong new customer recruitment and growing on a normalised basis. And if we just flip to the next slide and look at the order profile, here we can see the new and repeat split in terms of order numbers. And we can see the 38% increase in new, uh, repeat orders. And if you remember the previous slide, that gave us a 48% increase in value terms. New orders on a, on a normalised basis grew by 36%. And we simply extrapolated the pre-COVID run rate into the remainder of the, the six-month period to come up with that number. Marketing spend was accelerated in 2021 with a 1.2 million investment in TV advertising to build brand awareness. This campaign has proved successful in increasing both spontaneous and prompted awareness levels fivefold, as well as giving us a longer-term benefit to the brand. Customer Acquisition costs, or CAC as we refer to it, have risen in 20 compared with 2021, especially with the COVID benefit that we had in that year, but also with this major investment in TV advertising. And the cost of the acquisition has risen by approximately £11 over the pace. However, we are seeing this fall back down with the easing of the TV spend, coupled with new marketing campaigns around the introduction of the chilled range. And if we move to the next slide, we can see some analysis and data on our active customers. Active customers per the different definition at the bottom of the slide. And we can see a continued active growth in these active customers. New and repeat sales are key metrics for us as a company. New sales, as well as having a marketing cost, also have a discounted sales value. Repeat sales have the profit margin that drives the profitable business. And to put that into perspective, New orders have a 35% gross profit margin, whereas repeat orders have a 55% or more gross profit. The more repeat sales we has, have as a percentage of total revenue will improve our margin. And one of the key KPIs in the business is just to review and manage new and repeat discount levels as well. Just moving on to customer loyalty. Our customers are very loyal. They appreciate the call centre uh, operation times that I alluded to in the previous slide. They also like our messaging around customer, the, their customer demographic and how we are supportive and act as a champion for them. And this slide shows the customer loyalty or repeat spend pattern by recruitment cohort and consistent behaviour over the years. Average order value. I've mentioned the importance of average order value um, in the company. And the key for driving Parsley Box's growth is the continued improvement on repeat marketing and maintaining and not eroding our new AOV. We've continued to drive the repeat AOV with more products in the order basket, as well as higher value items, thus giving more margin as a consequence of relatively fixed fulfilment costs in relation to basket size. And we can see that gross margin detail with the combination of improvement in AOV and increased mix of repeat to new customers being reflected in that margin growth. And just to mention here, the introduction of our chilled range will have a higher storage pick, pack and distribution cost. However, these items at a higher price point, which will mitigate that. 
We will continue to review and manage the input process in the light of supply challenges on labour and raw materials, which we're hearing so much about, and would look to pass on any such impacts to our consumer. Just moving on to the balance sheet now. This is a, a summarised version of our balance sheet, and I just want to highlight a couple of areas here. Principally to mention the, the, the building impact or the property impact that I alluded to earlier on uh, in relation to the G&E costs. As I mentioned, social distancing requirements required us to double the size of our property footprint. That has required us to account for it in the, in the balance sheet, as you can see from the, the IIFRS uh, right of use asset classification in our asset values, etc. Just to be clear, we are capital light. We've only got about a couple of hundred thousand pounds worth of true assets in, uh, in that sense. But the double property costs incurred by social distancing will reduce when our second property lease ends in September. We're transitioning to one location as COVID and social distancing requirements ease, but we'll still have a level of remote and home working to support our staffing levels and we'll continue to report and manage to COVID requirements to ensure staff safety and mental health. In simple terms, the key thing to note here that in cash flow terms, the reduction in property will save us approximately 480k eh, on an annualised basis. Just the, the other point I'd like to mention here on the balance sheet is we have been working to reduce our stock levels with an eye on the introduction of the new chilled range and new and improved ambient product. This area will become more challenging with the introduction of chilled and its shorter shelf lives. And just to finish off, here's a very nice simple cash flow bridge. Um, this highlights the key areas of, of cash movement in the period, with the listing costs and the marketing spend being the main components. We closed the half year with 6.5 million in the bank. We also have an unused half million overdraft facility with the Royal Bank of Scotland. The main driver for the cash position is simply the marketing spend and will continue to drive the business growth via customer acquisition subject to this cash position. And I'll hand back to Kevin. Thanks, John. Uh, I think that was a good comprehensive review. So I'm just going to cover strategy and product. Um, so I think the most significant thing in terms of key hires that, that we made this year um, is our head of product, uh, Cassandra Suds. Um, so she basically joined in January as a consultant. So she's ex co-op m &S. She's also got significant experience in manufacturing. She's worked for Greencore and a couple of other businesses as well. And what um, we did with her uh, when she joined at the beginning of the year is we did a real review of the entire product strategy. We compared it with other retail products and really understood where our roadmap was going in terms of product. There's actually a detailed uh, presentation that's available uh, as well, uh, which gives you a really deep understanding of our product uh, strategy going forward and historically. And I think it's definitely worth the 20 minutes uh, and, and Cassie's very eloquent in talking about product and she's got a real passion for food, which uh, I think is very important to us. In terms of what really the, the, the tenets of our, our product strategy are, is really around two areas. Um, the first one is, is increasing our total addressable market. So this is really trying to be as relevant to as many consumers in our demographic as possible. Uh, and we have a very uh, you know, well-loved and, and highly repeat rate of orders from our core range. But we wanted to add a premium tier which really was to try and look at either additional special occasions within the, the home or for consumers that had slightly more to spend. And you know, we've successfully done that, and I'll talk about that uh, in, in the next slide. It's a higher price point. It compares very well with the uh, finest products or, or high, um, higher quality products within uh, leading grocers. But it also expands our total addressable market. And just to put that into perspective, the, the ready meal market uh, in 2020 uh, was, was around 5.9 billion. So it's, it's a massive market in itself. Um, but chilled is, is the biggest segment of that, around 3 billion of that market. So it gives us the room to play within that wider market. Uh, we still feel that um, our core range is very applicable, especially to maybe a slightly older consumer. And we do think with our uh, chilled range, it's going to 
bring a younger consumer, and when I talk about younger, I'm talking about probably 60 plus consumer, uh, into being uh, considering Parsibox where they maybe haven't considered it before. Really, the whole drive to that is obviously to increase that um, repeat order rate and also increase the average order value. And I'll talk about that uh, a little later as well. On the core ambient range, we really did want to use the opportunity where we saw some price pressure from uh, suppliers and from ingredients uh, and for transport costs to use that to actually elevate the product. And, and really, we kicked that off at the beginning of the year and we just launched uh, this week um, some of the results of that within our ambient range. It's not fully launched, but we certainly got the first phase. And we're doing things like you know, solely using British beef, um, using uh, local produce, using British dairy, um, free range eggs. Now that gives us um, two advantages is, is obviously it shortens our supply chain, but also it gives us more to talk to our consumers about. Um, and we've removed any ingredients that we have felt you know, weren't necessary or were used from a manufacturer ease perspective to try and uh, simplify the recipes and make them more home cooked and, and shorten the ingredient declaration. The other side of that is that that's going to reduce um, the, the the transport costs and also the um, distance from farm to our manufacturer. I mean, for example, our Yorkshire potatoes are uh, grown 15 miles away from, from our factory. So, you know, that really helps us from a supply-based benefit. And we should also start seeing that uh, later in the year as well. In terms of the chilled products, we just launched these at the beginning of August. So they are um, really brand new. Uh, we do believe that they are a step above uh, a number of the retail products. They've got longer shelf life, typically 21 day shelf life from delivery to the consumer. Um, they are premium price point. So 399 to 449. They're larger. Uh, one of the things that we gain feedback is that you know, our smaller or, or standard range are maybe not quite uh, as filling for some of our uh, large eater consumers. So these are larger meals, roughly 350 grams. But on a price point basis per gram, they're roughly the same price as our, as our core ambient range. We definitely think that uh, they compete um, with our uh, grosser products that you will have seen. And at the end of the presentation, there is a link for you to try them as well. So we welcome your feedback and see what you think about them. But very encouraging early signs. Now, I have to say that, you know, it, it is a shorter shelf life product. Typically, our core range is not about six months. So that does give us slightly more challenges that, than we've had historically. And as John mentioned, there is some issues around um, you know, labor and HGV, but we do believe that we've got this well balanced between the two ranges of products. Uh, I think most encouraging from my perspective um, is our marketing investment when we've tested um, these products within recruitment, and we've only done that in a limited way in August, we have seen significantly lower cost of acquisition. And that's probably driven by having a wider addressable market. But what we really need to see, which we will definitely see over the next couple of months, is the reorder metrics from that recruitment. Are they the same as our core range? Are they better? Are they slightly slower? So we will definitely update the market and, and shareholders once we have some more visibility over the next couple of months of that. But very promising signs, higher level of um, uptake than we had planned from our core customers and a definite benefit within recruitment, which we hopefully uh, will see in the second half. A couple of reviews, I'm sure you can have a look at some of those yourself. On the ambient product range, um, we really did, as I say, go back to basics and try to look at every product in the range, you know, over 100 products and say, how could we improve it? What would we like to do? How could we elevate the product? How could we look at um, improving the product as much as we possibly can, not just purely from a provenance perspective, but also just from an eating quality. We've used a thing called the Camden Stoke score, which marks product quality um, for taste and, and organoleptics. And we have looked at those benchmarked our existing products and always tried to then move the eating quality up, mainly by using ingredients, but also 
by thinking about moving some products to different suppliers. I mean, we mentioned sticky toffee pudding. We, we've definitely improved that product you know, dramatically uh, and, we, and we've launched that uh, this week and, and definitely think it's a, a step up in terms of product quality and is just as good as any chilled product that you would get out there. And is it really uh, quick to prepare uh, 30 seconds in the microwave and it's ready. So in terms of summary and outlook, um, re as I mentioned, you know, repeat order rates for the new products are a key data point. We really are very encouraged by it. We think that they will uh, be fairly transformational in stabilizing, if not low lowering, uh, cost of acquisition uh, in the second half. Uh, we don't have that TV in, as much of that TV investment as we did have in the first half. So we will see the benefit of that but we definitely feel that our cost of acquisition can come back down to a more normalized level, as you probably read within a, the admission document. Um, new price points should help us um, mitigate any risk around inflationary pressure from ingredients and, and labor. And we do feel that not only that, we've elevated the product. And um, we really do feel that we're seeing some really good potential um, from both chilled, our core ambient range, and the re reorder level from customers we've recruited in you know, current and previous cohorts. I think, as John mentioned, we see fairly similar behavior, uh, apart from the first half of 2020, of each cohort that we've um, recruited right the way through from 2018 to uh, 2021. So I think that gives us a lot of comfort of, of a continued growth journey and I think from our perspective, that's what we're focusing on is continuing to drive growth uh, in the business as much as possible. So thank, uh, thank you for attending, but I'm sure I can now turn over some to some Q&A. That's great. Kevin, John, thank you very much indeed for your presentation and updating investors this afternoon. Um, ladies and gentlemen, please do continue to submit your questions using the Q&A tab situated on the right-hand corner of your screen. But just while the company take a few moments to review the questions submitted already, I'd like to remind you the recording of this presentation, along with a copy of the slides and the published Q&A, can be accessed via your Investor Meet company dashboard. I'd also like to remind you that your feedback is important to the company, and immediately after this presentation has ended, you'll be redirected for the opportunity to provide feedback in order that the company can better understand your views and expectations. Um, Cal, obviously investors have had the ability to submit questions during today's event. I think uh, we've just lost John momentarily, so perhaps if you could address these to, to Kevin in the meantime. Um, yes, if, I, if, if I could ask you just to read out the question, uh, even perhaps who it's from and where appropriate to give a response, and then I'll pick up from you at the end. So thanks once again. Thank you, Mark. Um, David T would like to know what our churn rate is and customer long-term value. That's a great question. Um, so I, I, all you know, the, the churn in our core customer base is relatively low. Um, as you can see from the presentation, you can look at the cohorts of recruited customers and we've got a fairly predictable movement between customers that we recruit into customers that reorder. And we've modeled that. And I think if you even look back in the admission document, you will look at some modeled future value of those customers. Uh, as we get more data, uh, we obviously extend that, but we're fairly comfortable that, that we've got a good understanding of churn. It's relative, you know, our core churn is, is, is low percentages. In terms of customers that don't reorder, we do do a lot of activity to try and entice them back and reactivate them. So we do see that there is potential, of, like everybody, to look at improvement uh, to that in the future. And a question that we've had before today, and that's around supply chain issues and how we've been affected. Yeah, it's a great question. I think the entire food industry is, is being impacted. In fact, the entire um, retail industry has been impacted. What I would say is that, you know, with our ambient products specifically, we're able to have relatively high level of stock holding, um, you know, months to two months of, of stock within our uh, facility. So we're, that's relatively uh, unimpacted and um, although labor within factories does make it a little bit more uh, unpredictable than it was in the past I do think within our chilled range that's a bit more of a challenge because it is a um, slightly shorter shelf life and we need to hold less salt but we're monitoring it 
all the time and, and across the industry, everybody's having to deal with it. And I think we're monitoring it as closely as we possibly can. Thank you. Um, Simon has asked, can you talk about competitors in our marketplace and what you think differentiates us, us from them? Well, I mean, there, there's and consumers have got a wide range of choice. I think the first thing I would say is that because we've got very heavy focus on the 60 plus demographic there, you know, a ready meal from a retailer is very different from a ready meal from us. You know, you get very personal service from us. You choose exactly what you want, you get it delivered to your door and, um, you know, ne next working day. Um, so it's a different proposition from the retailers. Our customers do shop in retailers as well. So I wouldn't have said that we you know we're ignoring what's happening in supermarkets. We obviously are listening uh, and making sure that we've got the widest choice for consumers. Our closest competitors are a company like Wiltshire Farm Foods and, and Oak House Foods. And I think what we have the ability to do is respond much faster to consumers. We've got much more insight uh, because we've got a direct relationship with our consumers than those businesses have. And I think that's given us valuable insight to differentiate ourselves and to innovate as we go forward. An extension of that question from, from someone else is how we um, our prices compare to our competitors. I think we're very competitive. We're generally, um, we, we benchmark the, you know, the upper end of, of retail prices. You can buy you know, a ready meal cheaper in retail, just like you can buy a takeaway cheaper you know, from different uh, places. I think the reality is um, I, our, our customers really do value that service going back to that point. They can um, call us um, you know, pretty much any, whenever they want. They can speak to us for as long as they want. Uh, we don't limit that. Um, we you know we can be part of their daily interaction, and they can pay and choose delivery in whatever way they want. And so I think we do really offer very good value for money, and that's why I'm probably not concerned that even if we edge the price up to to, to take into account some of those uh, inflatory inflationary pressures, that we're going to see much reduction in demand. And I think just to add to that, Kevin, we, we, we've only increased prices once before and, and we didn't notice any impact from, from the customer viewpoint, I would say. Um, John, a question for you. When do we see cash break even? You know, that really comes down to how much money and how fast we want to, to grow the business, how much money we want to invest in, in marketing. I mean, on, on you know, over this year, we have been cash positive in, in a month here and there. And it really is reflective on the amount of marketing spend we're doing in that month. Over the coming year, we will still be slightly in a cash burn position. But as I say, that comes back down to how much uh, we wish to invest in the business and how fast we want to grow. Thank you. Um, Nick has come forward with an interesting question around ESG and asks, is it important to investors? What's your view on this? And and is your packaging, our packaging fully recyclable? Yes. Um, so uh, generally our, our packaging is recyclable apart from the film that's on the top of the tray. So um, that's made of a laminated material. So that's not recyclable. But, you know, you just rinse the tray out and we specifically use plastic white trays um, we don't use black white trays um, and the reason for that is that they're more widely recyclable and you just put them into your curbside re recycling and uh, they will be recycled alongside all of your other plastic um, products. Uh, I think our cardboard is, is widely recyclable and, and the basis of cardboard prices uh, we definitely encourage you to recycle as much cardboard as, as you want because the cardboard prices have gone up significantly over the last 12 months as well. Thank you. Um, how scalable is the operation space and um, how does this how does your preparation system work? Um, John perhaps you could take that please and explain um, the, the capital light nature of the business? Uh -huh. uh, I mean, we, uh, uh, by preparation system, if, if you mean the, the preparation of the food products, all of our preparation is, is outsourced to several suppliers. So we don't make or, or manufacture these products. We work closely with the, the suppliers to develop them and, and bring them to market, but it's their responsibility to, to produce that and deliver it to us. We are very capital light. Um, 
as I, I think I mentioned in the presentation, we only have a few hundred thousand pounds in terms of, of true capital spend, mostly around IT kit and some premises enhancements that we've had to do recently with, with COVID, etc. Um, the the buildings are all, all leased, so we outsource to a, a 3PL to do our pick, pack and, and dispatch, etc. So there is minimal investment there. As I, as I mentioned, the real spend and the real investment in this company is marketing to, to drive its growth and, and head it towards profitability in a, in a faster time. Okay, thank you. Um, what's the total headcount is a question and what do we anticipate it will be over the next 12 months? Currently we're at about 120 heads uh, and over the next 12 months I can see that growing maybe 10 or, or, or 15. Dep it really depends on the call centre. Again, I think as I mentioned in my presentation, we're putting more automation into the call centre so that we can automate the, the system to advise people that they're their goods are on their way and there will be a delivery window and all of that sort of stuff rather than us having to do outbound calling. However, again, as I mentioned, it's I, I think it's very important that we continue to act with our demographic in the call centre and, and talk to them and listen to them rather than just taking their orders and, and firing on, you know, to the next customer. And, and I think that pays us back in terms of, of customer and brand loyalty. Thank you. Um, Kevin, one question for you around the um, the market segment. Is it fragmented and is there scope for consolidation? Is M&A on the radar at all? Um, currently not. I mean, I, th I think our view is that if we were looking at M&A as we outlined in our uh, presentation and admission document, it would be to look at adjacent areas. And I think the adjacency we've always been thinking about is around consumption. So products and services that our customers do frequently and that are uh, difficult to replicate or, or more difficult to replicate, it's definitely something that we're always looking at. Uh, but really our focus at the moment is, is really trying to drive further uh, customer growth. We think there's still a lot of opportunity. And I have to say, from a, from an M&A perspective, there is a uh, few companies uh, that are focusing specifically on this demographic. And I do think we've already got the trust and relationship with our customers to extend into other products without having to do extensive M&A to achieve that. Thank you. Um, I've got a question here in relation to the shares. Um, the shares are extremely difficult to trade in size. This likely means institutional investors will not be able to invest. Does this concern you? Um, I think our job is, is, is obviously to drive and grow the business. And I, I do think that we obviously want to deliver a good return to all our shareholders. Um, but, you know, we, we definitely are constantly speaking to FinCap or broker uh, around uh, further institutional engagement and trying to make sure that, um, that, that there's as much uh, liquidity in our shares as we possibly can have. And we've had a more a general question about the share price performance, if you can shed any light on that at all. Um, I, I'm not sure there's much I can do specifically <laughs> around the, the, the vagaries of market performance. And I think I'm better and I think the team's better focus on on actually driving um, to deliver further growth and further you know, long-term profitability. And I think the share price will therefore follow at that point. Thank you. Um, is adjusted re um, repeat EBITDA still a <coughs> key metric to use and how is it looking today, John, one for you? Um, well, when I laid out the, the, the financial summary um, on the, the, the slide deck. I did give a, an EBITDA before and after exceptional items just to highlight that. I mean, this has been an exceptional year for us with um, the IPO, etc. So, you know, going forward, I don't see that there being many exceptional items going forward. We will, we will potentially have share-based payment adjustments as we go through uh, year on year. But apart from that, I think there will be minimal impact for us. And, and I would say the one thing we do try and do is, you know, we do try and keep it very simple. We we expense all of our marketing costs. We don't 
you know, capitalize the benefit and amortize, you know, the brand marketing or anything that we, we do like that. We, we keep it very simple in terms of a, you know, a pretty much a cash basis in terms of what we invest in marketing is, is pure cash. You know. Thank you. Okay. And how do you balance growth and marketing spend be you know I think that's that's a that's a very good question you know I think as as we've always had the view within the company that we would really want to to drive this company forward as quickly as we can and really own this market so I think it's important that we do that and um you know I, th I hope the investors understand that that's the reason why we're investing in marketing and spending money and, and, and burning cash, basically. We want to grow the business, and the sooner we get to that that critical point where we have that level of, of repeat business, we will be cash positive and we will be profitable. And it's just how long do we want to take to get to that point? Okay. Um, will DNA drop back to lower level is a question. It seems to have grown quickly. Um, and is it all COVID related? Well, as I mentioned, there is a there is a big slug in, in terms of, of, of COVID related, but that's more in relation to the loss, John. I, I can answer that one. So oh. um it isn't yeah. oh. sorry, can you hear me, Ken? Yeah, I, right, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you, John. Go, right, do go right. ahead. I think I think Kevin right. was going to jump in as well, so please do okay. carry on. No, my my, I dropped out earlier on, and I don't know what happened, but I apologise for that. So, um, Jeannie, yeah. yes, no, we, um, we are. Sorry. In terms of G&E, uh, there was a, a big increase this year. We have invested heavily in some key staff. John, John may, may I just cut in, but. John, if I may just just cut in there, perhaps I can hand over just to Kevin. I think uh, John's signal has uh, just dropped down. Um, uh, Cal, um, there is there is one question there from Steve S. I, I don't know if you can pick that one up, Cal. In the meantime, it, it reads it, it reads as follows: What kind of FCF margin do you aspire to? Kevin, are you able to take that? Yeah, so I think um, from, from our perspective, there has been some one-off uh, costs and in, in overheads, I think, as John outlined. Um, we do stay head count, um, you know, a, a good environment for our team to work. So we do expect that to reduce uh, over, over the next 12 months. Uh, and we probably have seen most of the last of, of any I of think, the... I um, think, uh, Cal, obviously, thank you for, for addressing all those questions. I think that takes care of pretty much every question that's been submitted by investors today. So thank you, firstly, to all of the investors that have taken time to show interest in the company and certainly by providing these questions. Um, Kevin, I guess perhaps before I know uh, investor feedback is important to you, but perhaps before I redirect investors to provide you feedback, I could ask you just for a few closing comments, uh, just to wrap up. And then, as I say, I'll redirect investors so they can give you their thoughts and expectations. That's great, Mark. Um, so just thank you again for attending today. And I do think that um, we should remember that, you know, the business is four years old and has achieved a great deal and the team uh, has done a, a massive amount uh, to achieve that, especially through that first half of 2020. So I really do hope that, one, you will try the products uh, and, and actually give, give them a go. But I definitely really welcome any feedback and look forward to hearing from you uh, and speaking to you uh, over the coming six months or so. Kevin, John, Cal, thank you once again for updating investors this afternoon. Can I please ask investors not to close this session as we'll now automatically redirect you for the opportunity to provide your feedback in order that the management team can better understand your views and expectations. This will only take a few moments to complete, but I'm sure will be greatly valued by the company. On behalf of the management team of Parsley Box Group PLC, we'd like to thank you for attending today's presentation. That now concludes today's session and good afternoon to you all.